It's very tough now. How many people do you know are going to run for Congress? Especially progressive people. I mean, that takes a lot of courage. Who wants to get out there if you're going to lose? And he has a very good chance of winning. So, whatever little push I can give, I'm happy to do that. You saw Pierce Morgan? I saw you, and that was excellent. Oh, thank you. I would have waved if, I, if I'd known you were watching. Well, that's always scary, you know? You don't want to... I mean, I feel a responsibility to people like you. And, and by the way, we're popular now. You know, our position is popular. Our problem is we can't get people who agree with us to say so out loud. So, I, you know, this is an interesting challenge. We're going to have to get used to being popular. That's the first thing we have to do. Uh, but we want to encourage other people to stand up. I think that's the only thing in the way of a sane foreign policy. We got to get off this rootin' tootin' shootin', uh, bomb everything. Yeah, I mean, we really are risking, I think, the safety of our children. I mean, our kid, my grandchildren, are they going to be in a, you know, in a culture where they're always looking around? Am I on the wrong bus? You know, that's what we're setting up for our kids. I'm very good at telling people what they already know. So, I have no doubt that uh, you already, you may have come to these conclusions before I did. But our mission is to change the country to the sun, more uh, solid footing, and let's try to get rid of this. Don't mess with Texas attitude that has infiltrated our national dialogue. You can't get elected if you're not tough. And that's what's killing us. That's why war is so easy, as uh, Norman has so well made the point in his book. And I'm here to hopefully help Norman uh, turn the corner here and encourage more and more people who agree with us to stand up and say so. And that isn't, that's certainly not an impossible. And we're not the stars in our eyes here. We, uh, Norman is a realist, and I think he's right now in a very good position. Uh, you know, Norman is strong, and he's strong in the new district. And all we got to do is get those people who agree with what he says out the door and to vote. And you're going to do that, I have no doubt. And you're going to, of course, make a lot of money standing there with signs. <laughs> Everybody knows how rich you get doing this. <laughs> So I, I'm pleased to uh, have this chance to meet you in person. I'm, uh, I'm not sure I started to, you know, you give a talk show host a microphone. I mean, <laughs> I mean, come on. <laughs> but I'd watch your show if you had one, so. Uh, you all look very friendly to me. It's fun to be in a crowd like this. I've met a lot of nice people along the way. All kinds of people. Park Avenue people have meetings in their grand uh, living rooms to fight the fight that you are already engaged in. It's very, it's just fascinating to me that there are so many different, all classes, all colors are agreeing with us and they're willing to get out the door and plant signs in lawns and make a little noise or rap on doors and uh, get some attention for our noble purpose, which is to pro you know, provide a, a country for our kids so they, they won't be able to raise their children and not be worried. And please, God, let's not bomb any more countries. Um, <laughs> seems obvious to me. Our problem is getting other people to see it. I do think they see it. I mean, we are embarrassed that this nation that spends two billion dollars a day, Norman told me this, and it is true, check it, two billion dollars a day on things that go boom. And we bomb Grenada. Grenada. I mean, we should be embarrassed by this. We hit them. We hit them. Well, that's true, but the point is, those who are embarrassed are not saying so. It's a, it's tough to, it's tough to be an, a, a dissenter. 
They don't like this scent. No kidding. I mean, you know, if you you're, people say to me, that's the trouble with you liberals. You don't like anything about America. I mean, they they hit you with everything. If you criticize America, you don't like anything about America. Uh, you don't understand geopolitical. Bill O'Reilly told me. You don't understand geopolitical. I don't think he knew what geopolitical meant. Uh, so the marginalization, the attempt to marginalize, uh, marginalize us is pretty, pretty strong. And often it's brilliantly executed. By the time we're, they're through with us, we even changed our name. We're not liberals anymore. We're progressives. Excuse you for breathing. I'm a progressive. Uh, isn't that interesting, though? You know, we've been so marginalized that we're almost ashamed of our own name. Oscar Wilde, apologies, but a liberal has become the political idea that dare not speak its name. And we have to fight back against that. Somehow we have to let them know that we, hell, we love America more than they do. If you put the Bill of Rights to a vote in this crowd, it would pass. <laughs> you can't say that. Certainly you can't, couldn't say that about the Bush administration. All men are created equal unless we're scared. And then the bedrock of our nation begins to get chipped away. Amazing. It's amazing. Democracy, democracy, they yell. They're turning their back on the fundamental feature of this democracy. Which is, you know, you don't put a man in a cage without any, no habeas, no letters to home, no phone calls, no Red Cross. This is awful. The, the, the framers were right. There is something that it is. Separation of church and state, they were right. And what, what the opposition does with that is, we don't love God, and they do. That's the coup de grace. And they're running around tripping over their robes. God bless this, that, my dog and my cat. Oh, sit down. We don't engage. We don't engage in false piety for political gain. We will never do that. And we're proud. Our faith, should it exist, comes from in here. And we should be appalled at these people. Who are, you know, saying God bless everybody is like kissing a baby. Uh, Rick Santorum is now on his horse. Boy, he wants to, you know, the straight of Hormuz. He's ready to attack Iran. He's ready to go. The drumbeat is beginning. The heavy breathing. I mean, we're going to go again. And we'll send another 4,000. So that's why we have to stand up. I'm not telling you anything. And that's why I admire what you're doing. You are what we call grassroots. And there's no democracy without us. And I'm pleased to be among your number here. I just don't want you to ask me difficult questions. <laughs> I apologize, Marlo's uh, on Broadway and not able to be here. Uh, I'll tell her, I'll tell her of your uh, generous welcome. It's, in a way, it's kind of, there is a little relief. Uh, when I'm with Marlo, people knock me over to get to her. <laughs> You know, it's, you know, and then somehow after they meet, they finally look at me, you know, and say, oh, we like you too, Murph. <laughs> so, so I'm, here I am, I'm, I feel naked, not walking around with Marlo. She takes care of me and, uh, you know, not a, oh, I'll tell you so. Uh, no, I, I'm not, uh, I'm just saying that uh, I wish she was here for Norman's sake because she does have her own uh, audience out there and I know she would be very uh, influential if we get this out here. Broadway, by the way, producers will not let you go anywhere. Uh, the 50th anniversary of St. Jude was last uh, weekend. And the 100th anniversary of my father-in-law, who founded the uh, hospital, Danny Thompson. When I married Marlo Thomas in 1980, my father-in-law stood to say, I haven't lost a daughter, I've gained a fundraiser. <laughs> and so that's been, uh, I've been living with, uh, I married a hospital. And here we are, still walking around after 31 years. Well, let's get in there. Bill, what do you think about today's school? 
Well, uh, what do I think about today's education system? Well, I think the first thing is let's make sure we don't join this anti-teacher band. We're somehow... Lost the mic. We can still hear you a little bit. Did I hit the mute button? Check, check, check. Okay, it's going. Test, test. <laughs> well, just because there's snow on the roof doesn't mean the fire's out in the furnace. <laughs> Anybody else? Yes, sir. What advice do you have for the occupied? Well, this is tough. Um, I have a son who came home, bought a sleeping bag, went to Washington, slept out, came back to New York, to Zagati, Zagati Park, and I said, where's the sleeping bag? He said, I left it in the box. It's someone else who does. So I have, a, I have a son who gets this and is actually a part of it. And he's always been there. I mean, he couldn't figure out Reagan. He, he just was bewildered. So I have a, uh, I don't want to say a clone, because he, he certainly thinks for himself. Uh, but I have a, a son who really is, in, yeah, kindred and I'm on my way to him, so. uh, The Occupy movement, I think, is hugely important. Our problem is get it focused and move the ball down the, the, down the kick the can down the street, make some progress and convince more and more people that we're on the wrong track. I think the Occupy movement does that. And I think there's gotta be people on Wall Street looking out that window and seeing those people down there feeling very, very guilty. They used our money, our money, to give themselves bonuses. What's the shaft to us? And how many of us have you know, remained mute? We got, everything's in place, all we gotta do is speak up. And, you know, try very hard to speak to people who don't agree with us. And see if we can't just swell our ranks here for Norman and for the future of this nation. Anybody else? Sir. When I was young, very young. When you were one? When I was young, very young, there used to be a thing called usury wars. There was a thing called what? Usury. Usury. Oh, yeah. Usury laws, which has, are no longer in effect. What has happened is that we speak of money as a thing. No, money is like what is we, we say in church, full faith and credit. Money is the government's job to share things, to allow people to share things. Money is not gold. Money is not oil. Money is not earth. Money is just a means of trade. Why is not the government in charge of this instead of the people who are making profit on money, which is a commodification of money? Well, you've obviously been thinking about this maybe longer than I have. I'm very impressed with your analysis. I agree with you. Uh, Lenny Bruce said, uh, Bob Dylan said, money doesn't talk, it screams obscenity. And that's true, and that's certainly part of what you share with us. I agree with you. Uh, and Norman is excellent, incidentally, on the corporatization of this nation. Media. Uh, media, it, it used to be, a, <laughs> it used to be, you know, you had a lot of people getting the news. I was a news reporter in Adrian, Michigan. I, I reported the, foot, the high school football scores. <laughs> I reported the deaths and the births in Lenawee County. Nobody's doing that anymore. Their radio stations are reverse ATM machines. You know, they take your money. And they're, they're, as you know, they're all belonging to the same company now. And the, what you get is a, a material on those radio stations that, pure, that is pureed in a, somewhere far, far away. There are no football, high school football scores on radio stations anymore. 
not even local labor. This is this is what the concentration of media has done. And right now, the reporting community, which used to be a whole lot of people running around, even me, I used to run around. What what it looked like when you got here, Chief? You know, and the chief said. It looked like a fire, dummy. What do you think it looked like? You know, the barn would be collapsing behind it. Well, those my first experiences with media. Now, the, the center, you could, ex you could depend that the center of this large community of reporters could be found the truth. Today, that center is occupied by four com five companies, larger and larger in scope, and a lot more interested in the price of their stock than they are in spending the money that it takes to go out and do independent investigative journalism. That is expensive, it doesn't always pay off, you can throw a lot of money at a, at a story and it may fall right through the trap door. It may not be something you can actually use. And not too many corporate executives are willing to do that. Why take the risk? You know, just rip it off the wire and read whatever somebody else thinks is the news. So that's just, uh, and that's another reason why war is made so easy. Yes, ma'am. This may not be a seminal issue, but I embrace I, I said this may not be a seminal issue, and I embrace diversity. It, it's, it's one of the things I've welcomed since we moved to California from New York. But I found it really uncomfortable over the holidays to not know how to greet people anymore because someone said to me at the gym, you really shouldn't even say happy holidays because some people don't celebrate those. And it's gotten to the point where you're not sure what to say anymore. And I don't know. I just wonder how you feel about that. I respect your opinions. Fox has run with this. Uh, the war against Christmas. I mean... Let's understand this strategy. If they can convince the nation that there is a war against Christmas, what they mean is the war has been declared by us. And what does that mean? That means we don't love Jesus. And this strategy works. Who wants to vote somebody in office that doesn't like Jesus? It's, um, it's making the Lord the, the 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 victim that we are criticizing and uh, diminishing the power that they see. We've got a, a dogma is what's killing us. If you don't believe what I believe, you're obviously not as holy as I am. You're not as close to God. And the separation of church and state is a fabulous idea. The framers were right. You know, if if a person is elected who talks to God every day, that's fine with me. He can be the President of the United States, assuming everything. What we don't want is a person who talks to God every day and God talks back. <laughs> that's the reason for the separation of church and state. But, you know, it's much easier to, to, to characterize people on the left side of the aisle as anti-church, anti-religion, and we aren't. You can, you know, you can worship a pet rock. We don't care. That is your business. But don't be evangelizing us. Don't run around telling us how you're, you've got God and we don't. That's how we go to war. I hope I'm not, I hope Jesus isn't listening. <laughs> to say that... You're never going to be a talk show. Um, no, I hope not. <laughs> uh, she said I hope not. <laughs> I'm a, a member of Grandmothers for Peace and the School of the Americas Watch. Really? Um, and I wanted to give you this book. My husband was a veteran of the Abraham Lincoln Brigade. And he, he died in America. Grandmothers for Peace. We gotta have. I gotta I love yeah, a lot of good it's done. I've belonged to it since 1982, and we haven't had peace since then. Now make sure you don't guess. Yeah. <laughs>
I think we need to get the democracy. Oh, we want to make sure. I mean. <laughs> I think we need to get the democracy back in Congress and the filibuster out of the Senate. There you go. Well, who doesn't agree with that? Uh, you shouldn't be able to talk your way uh, into killing a good idea. And obviously, that's what's happening. Everything conspires to the benefit of the incumbent. Um, you, you, it's hard to get uh, unseat a, uh, a member of Congress. Incumbency is valuable. They don't want to lose. And they have the power to do everything they can to make it difficult for you to defeat them, including getting registered. In the Republican debate yesterday, I think it was yesterday, one of the uh, people that's running, uh, they asked him where he would be if he wasn't there. He said, on the shooting range. <laughs> No, it, no, it's everything is a little bit Dr. Strange love now, and uh, and don't we miss Donald Trump? I mean, uh, I mean, is this a best reality show out there or not? A uh, uh, Herman Cain. Oh man, you know the lights went out on the campaign when he got out. Yeah, he was something. Well, what'd you do about Libya? Libya. Let me see Libya. <laughs> um, That's yeah. Rick. Yeah. No, he's uh, he's something. I uh, I miss him. This was this was the best reality show we had. This year. <laughs> Sir. What are the driving forces behind the efforts to get this country to attack Iran, and what needs to be done? In my view, it cannot wait till November. Um, well, let's. This is this is interesting to me. Uh, I can't vote for Ron Paul. Sorry, there's too much baggage. But when he said, "Why are we doing all these wars? Why are we intervening in so many countries?" He is the only candidate out there on either side of the line saying that. <laughs> Mitt Romney won't say that because he believes if he does, he won't be reelected. He won't be elected to office. And what really troubles me is that he may be right. You have to be tough to get elected. You have to be rooting to shoot. If you're against the war, or you just you're, we're all going to be standing in a line. They do an apocalyptic analysis on this. If we, if we're not tough, if we're not tough, we're going to be taken over by some foreign alien civilization, and we'll all be standing in a line with tattooed numbers on our arm. This is the fear, and it it's so unnecessary. This nation's constitution is assembled to ensure that we are protected. Nobody is, you know, the way they talk, we think, you know, liberals are people who would just let the enemy march in. That is not the truth. And by the way, if you oppose the war, you got to tell them what you would do about Hitler. <laughs> I ought to know. <laughs> Hitler gave war a good name. And, and, the, and the, you know, the, their immediate judgment is if you're against the war, you're against all wars. I mean, and obviously, who wants to vote for somebody who isn't tough or is not going to defend our liberties and all that? It's a, it's a very complicated and difficult door to open. But I do believe Norman and other pe people like him. And by the way, he will not be alone in Congress. We have, we have supporters in Congress. Pete Stark. Mm -hmm. Pete Stark, in my film, and I hope if you, those some of you haven't seen, stands up in the middle of this film. Well, these guys are going off to war. Hey, uh, 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 the little kid says, bye, Daddy. And we switch to Pete Stark. And he says, you are giving an inexperienced young man in the White House the execution lever to kill thousands of Americans. Some of you did that. And you can go down and look at the 50,000 names on the wall. 
He was the most succinct and powerful voice in the entire Iraq war debate, which gave Bush the permission to go to war. This was not a constitutional, only Congress can declare war. As, as Robert Byrd makes the point in our film, the framers felt, James Madison, it's too much power to give to one man. And boy, haven't we learned that. And there, no one, no Congress, no Congress has observed Article One, Section 8 of the Constitution. Only, con only Congress, they don't want the job. If they're wrong, it could be politically fatal. Nobody wants to be on the wrong side of a war. I mean, if our candidates can't even talk about the war. And we'll be bombing more people because of it. And that's what we're going to change. Sir? Uh, in 2009, yeah. uh, we marched on Washington. United. In 2009, you marched on Washington. Yeah, United for Justice. United we for Justice. We met in Maryland before we marched because the policy was not to uh, address um, conspiracy theories. And Building 7 going down, you know, unexpectedly, why did it go down? You know, loose change, how did Turner plant the stuff in the shafts? And I know implosion, like, you know, there's two types of lobbyists. Those who implode legislation and those who are proactive. Right. Proactivists need more money. But what do you feel about conspiracy theories and this, this you know, we, we said we're not going to talk about it in United for Justice. We, we said we'll just fight the war. The conspiracy theory. It's a pretty valid theory of, you know, the neoconservatives, you know, they, de they designed those buildings to go down. Uh, you, you know, talk about the towers, not the... towers and, and the, the plane landing in the Pentagon. And all, there's right. too many, you know, where were the bodies, where were the baggage, Pennsylvania. You know, in, 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 the silent majority has to speak up. I agree with you. And Twitter is, it's it. Everybody, learn how to tweet that, baby, and hashtag. You, you know, I'm catching up with that. Yeah, you are. You I know. My grandchildren help me. This is the mouse. <laughs> they speak very slowly uh, to help me understand. Uh, we want to be careful, though. You know, the conspiracy theory is a distraction, usually. It, it takes your, you, you, you lose your focus and your microphone. <laughs> um, and I, you know, I just never, uh, I've never been particularly excited about, I think it would be a great story. Is that an eager? Yes. Um, Aren't they beautiful? You people should be ashamed of yourself. I mean, what are you going to do when they find this neighborhood? You won't have a, you won't be able to build enough apartment building. Yes, ma'am. I'm not enough. <laughs> I think most of us are aware we have an issue in Petaluma that's facing us, and we're fighting an a uh, asphalt plant that has been approved, I would say, by corrupt supervisors. Uh, I would question the judge and his judgment, and it's at the gateway to Petaluma. It's in a very, very poor area. You want to see the egret? It's right across from our bird sanctuary. You this want to make sure it stays there. Uh, the birds, yeah. Um, we proved that uh, their EIR reports, everything is is inaccurate. Yet it continues to pass. But this is one small little piece of a of a global puzzle, because it seems that money and corruption, big business, oil companies are are hell bent in destroying our planet and taking away the space that our wildlife lives in. The Japanese are out there killing whales. The Austria Australians are trying to board the ships to stop it. Where do we get control of this? Because we only have one tiny little planet. This is it. I'm not moving to the moon. I'm not looking for Mars. This is all we have. And yet, how do we get the machine to stop and turn around. We need to be the caretakers of the planet, not the destructors. What do we do? Where do we get this machine back on track? Okay. Well, as you know, I'm a brilliant man. Uh, I don't have one answer. Uh, it is 
you know, it is our planet, it is our neighborhood. And let's not be, let's not be totally discouraged here. More and more people are on this bandwagon. They see it. They want their grandchildren to see an egret. And those are the people who are inspired to do something about it. I have a relationship with the Connecticut Audubon Society. And I, you know, these are young people. And I see them out there worried about the purple martin, who, which uh, uh, migrates to Brazil every year and comes back to my backyard in April. It's a wonderful, wonderful natural phenomenon. My grandchildren are totally wrapped watching this. They might not have that opportunity, or their children may not have that opportunity in the future. We're, and, and by the way, not everybody is spewing, you know, more and more corporations are realizing that it's in their financial interest to scrape, make sure there are scrapers on the chimneys and whatever other technologies are out there to help us be, be and stay green and maybe greener. I think this is a good time to have you welcome the next congressman from the newly shaped second congressional district in California. I give you Norman Solomon. Thank you, and thanks to everybody. Thanks to everyone for being here, you know, thinking of the egrets in this beautiful day. The children who should be able to play in Schoenberger Park should be able to play a year from now, a decade from now, and a century from now. Yeah. And that means no Dutra plant. Years ago, years ago, I was at a hearing here in Petaluma. Hundreds of people there, and we heard the scientific testimony. It's an open and shut case. No Dutra plant. If we care about children, if we care about the environment and future generations. As Phil said, quoting Bob Dylan, money doesn't talk, it screams. And silence, as the AIDS activists told us in the 80s, and they were absolutely correct, in a lot of situations having to do with politics and choices, silence equals death. We can't afford, the planet can't afford for us to be silent. And frankly, if you'll forgive me being a little political here for a moment, I wish that my opponents in this race, I wish all of them and the leading opponent, I wish that folks would step up to the plate and say, do not license the Dutra plant. Yeah, yeah. Now here we are in this beautiful, beautiful environment and the beauty includes the Apple Box Cafe. And I want to thank Zora for being such a host the entire cafe. This is a community treasure. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, many times I've had meetings here and hung out with folks. It's so, so the spirit is wonderful, as well as the food and the surroundings. Also, taking a picture at the moment, Jason Davies, thanks for pulling together this event today. You know, in politics, there's a lot of talk about grassroots, but what is crucial about grassroots is that it's genuine. No astroturf, right? Our campaign does not and will not accept a single penny of corporate PAC money. Not ever. And this is, as they say, prefigurative. Because taking corporate money as a politician is habit forming. And next thing you know, they're on the floor of the Assembly or the Congress, and they're voting on measures that will be profit and loss to the tune of millions or even billions of dollars, and they've taken money from lobbyists in Sacramento or from corporate PACs that got them to Washington, and that's wrong. We want to occupy Congress for the 99%. Phil mentioned the film, Body of War, and if you have a chance, to join with us tonight in Sebastopol, please do, and bring your friends. I've never seen a more important film. 
Phil put years of his life into executive producing that film. And we're going to show it tonight as part of our campaign activities in Sebastopol at 7.30 at the Sebastopol 9 uh, Cinema on McKinley. So I hope you can join us. We're looking, of course, at concentric crises. And right here in southern Sonoma County, we're part of the ground zero. The foreclosures that are going on. The news today, resignation built daily from the White House Chief of Staff. Maybe next time the White House can get a Chief of Staff who didn't come from J.P. Morgan Chase. You think? You think that's possible? Now let me be clear. I'm a loyal Democrat. I was elected as an Obama delegate to the Democratic National Convention. I understand that as progressives we have a responsibility to defeat Republicans. And we also have a responsibility to defeat the Republican agenda, including when it's being pushed by Democratic leaders. And that means fighting Wall Street. I'm very proud that three and a quarter years ago, when on the floor of the House of Representatives, the debate was going on, are we going to do this bailout for the big Wall Street banks? I spoke out and had a piece in the daily paper here in the North Bay. I said, there is no reason to believe that this taxpayer bailout of Wall Street banks will increase loans for small businesses and allow people to keep their homes. And unfortunately, I was correct. It's about time that we redefine what it means to be a grassroots Democrat to say that we don't want Main Street squashed by Wall Street. And we don't want Wall Street dominating Pennsylvania Avenue in Washington, D.C. at either end, the White House or the Capitol. And we've got an opportunity. This is a deeply progressive district, and really, Petaluma is part of the hub. You know, there's been a redistricting, but this district now that will have a new congressperson, and we know because of the registration it's going to be a democrat the question is what kind of democrat it includes marin county petaluma west county and then mendocino and humboldt and up north to the oregon border a very deep blue progressive district and i'm really proud that when i spoke to the california democratic party progressive caucus at the annual convention last spring in sacramento when I was done with my 15-minute presentation, the next speaker was Congressman Mike Honda from the South Bay, very progressive. And he said, first thing he said was, Norman is a young Bernie Sanders. The young part, not really. <laughs> I noticed Phil called me a, a young man. That's, you know, poetic license there, talk show host license. Uh, but um, I do aspire to be in the footsteps of Bernie Sanders, we and in the footsteps of Lynn Woolsey. We need and we want and we can have people in Congress who will not be silent, who will speak out, who will be willing to say that we don't want to live in a country dominated by Wall Street and we don't want to live in a warfare state. Two years ago, I went to Afghanistan. I wasn't embedded. I didn't go escorted by anybody from the embassy. I went with Rick Reyes, who had previously come to Afghanistan with an M16 in his hands, right after 9-11, that fall. And he came back with me because he realized that this perennial war by the United States of America is wrong. And Rick and I went to refugee camp, we went to talk to NGO officials and people on the street. And I saw U.S. soldiers in the streets of Kabul. And the light bulb went on that each one of those soldiers costs $1 million to keep there for one year. This is what Martin Luther King Jr. was referring to when he talked about the madness of militarism. Can you imagine to bring back one more U.S. soldier from Afghanistan could mean that we would have 
one million more dollars. Let's go to Petaluma City Hall. Can you imagine? This afternoon, let's walk to Petaluma City Hall and say, here's a check. Pay to the order of the city of Petaluma. What could we do with that money? A few weeks ago, with 600 other people, I was at the annual Cots breakfast. And we need these nonprofit organizations. They are a lifeline, quite literally. And they are being asked to assume a burden that is way too big, an economy in the tank year after year. We need our nonprofits and our charities. They can't fix this economic disaster. It is too big. There are too many people suffering. And COTS is a heroic organization doing what it can. And yet, as the speakers lamented from the podium that morning, they're turning people away in Petaluma. And this is happening across this county, across the state and the country. That's why we need a Green New Deal. That's why we need a transaction tax on Wall Street. One quarter of 1% transaction tax would bring to the Treasury of the U.S. government $150 billion with a B dollars a year. And I'm very proud that I've co-chaired for several years now the Healthcare Not Warfare campaign with Donna Smith, who you saw in Michael Moore's film Sicko, and Congressman John Conyers, who I'm glad to say has endorsed me in this race for Congress, who has introduced a bill called the 21st Century Humphrey Hawkins Full Employment and Job Training Act. It's a mouthful, but here's what it comes down to. Two components. For the first time, commits this country to full employment. Full employment. And the second component is that transaction tax that will free up the money to begin to bring us the Green New Deal that we need. So as I uh, sort of wind, uh, wind up here and get off my soapbox, I want to mention that we're going to make change the old-fashioned way by doing the work. We already have hundreds and hundreds, more than 600 volunteers signed up for our campaign for Congress. And it's a process where dedication, idealism, and hard work go together. You know, a few blocks from here, uh, we had a rally uh, late summer for the campaign. We had uh, Casimiro Alvarez, the political Northern California director for the United Farm Workers, and he talked about the struggles of farm workers. And by the way, you know, whether it's that Dwight Wabbit or anybody else, we're not going to stand for bigotry in our communities and appeals to bigotry. <laughs> Demonization of immigrants is not our way and it's not our future. So that's an aside, perhaps. But at this rally, when Casimiro Alvarez spoke, he talked about the need to challenge our own state government, which has to yet implement laws for the rights of farm workers to unionize. And that's a federal battle as well. And we need to fight that battle until it's won. And another speaker there, another speaker was Sean Penn. And he said, I think quite correctly, that the Tahrir Square uprising in Egypt that toppled the tyranny of Mubarak, he said it was based on what he called principle as strategy. Just be one of how are you going to do it? You start with the bedrock and you stay on the bedrock. Principle as strategy. We are sticking with principle in this campaign and we're doing the nuts and bolts too. You know, interesting thing about conventional wisdom is it's conventional, but a lot of times it's not wisdom. And one of the things of conventional wisdom in politics is you've got to take corporate money or you can't win. Well, tell that to Bernie Sanders who doesn't take corporate PAC money and he keeps winning in Vermont, and we can do that here. Right? And also, you don't have to ingratiate yourself to the power structure, the local or state or national power structure. So I'm very proud to sort of sum up. We not only have more than 600 volunteers, we not only have more than 3,000 discreet donors, and as I learned in this lingo, discreet doesn't mean that they're real polite and don't make a scene. <laughs> more than 3,000 different individuals who've given us money. They've written a check, or they've gone to the Solomon for Congress website, and they've contributed by credit card, and by the way, that's very much appreciated. And also, We've done more house parties than all the other campaigns put together by far. 
and I'm getting good at inviting other people to invite me into their home, so consider yourself invited to invite me. But seriously, this is how we're doing it. And we're in county after county doing the grassroots, and that's what it's going to be about, because people say, oh, well, the election's a while off. Not the way we see it on this campaign. The ballots are going to drop in the mail in four months. So every day and every hour really counts. Uh, let me close on this note. Knowing our history is so important. As Orwell said, those who control the past control the future. Those who control the present control the past. It's only in mythology that it was obvious what should be done during the Vietnam War, that people should speak out. It was obvious to fight for the public accommodation civil rights laws when they were in contention. It was not obvious at the time. It took people being willing to speak out and speak up. And the metaphor is there, sometimes you see a wire on the street, and it takes a bird to get on the wire. And then pretty soon, the wire is filled with birds. And that's part of social movements, and our campaign is part of social movements. Phil Donahue is an example of somebody who, during the months before the invasion of Iraq, was the only national network talk show host to consistently bring on the voices of dissent. And he did it day in and day out. In retrospect, we know that that was not only a moral position, it was a correct decision, it was a wise decision, and it took a lot of courage. We know today that there are positions that if we stand true with them, we're going to make some enemies, and we might even lose some friends, which is even harder. But we need to do it. We've got to do it. Dr. King said, a nation that year after year continues to spend more money on military defense than on programs of social uplift is approaching spiritual death. And we may not think of it in exactly those words, but whatever words we think about it, we know in our heart of hearts that if you keep going somewhere, you may get there. Our destination is very different for ourselves and future generations, and we can go somewhere very different together. And I think we really will. So thanks again for being here and on with our future.